There should be a requirement that you have to have at least a triple-digit IQ in order to blog. Well, that certainly would cut down on the blogs. Or at least over 60. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I mean, this is basic English language comprehension stuff here. Pistols, Prayer, and Potluck. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. A show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. This is episode 363, and I am your guest host, Brian, formerly the lead vocalist for Meta Lloyd. At least until they kicked me out. Lloyd is still a little under the weather with some kind of viral bronchitis. But don't worry, I am in charge. This week we have a wonderful show for you, a variety show I believe they call it. We have content from all the cast members, except for Lloyd, of course. We have a Ballistic Minute from Sergeant Bill, a new segment from Mia and Stein, and a new pastoral pontification from Pastor John Bennett. And before we begin, I would like to thank all the members of the Reformation Gun Club, who make the show possible. This week's shout-out goes to, Dan, from Enum Claw, Washington. Donnie, from White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Jerry and Billy, from Deer Lodge, Montana. William, from Duncanville, Texas. Luke from Seymour, Indiana. John Nielsen. Robert, from Bothell, Washington. Mike, from Hiram, Georgia. The Disreputable Bartlett. And Kevin, from Fairfax, Missouri. Thank you to these good people and all the members of the Reformation Gun Club. Armed Lutheran Radio is listener-funded. That means that we do not have any sponsors or advertisers. So we rely on these good people and their monthly and yearly contributions to keep doing what we do. If you would like to find out more about becoming a member, if you would like to take advantage of all the benefits, like hundreds of hours of exclusive content, some cool swag, and invitations to our monthly online hangouts, visit armedlutheran.us slash gun club to find out all the details and to sign up. Membership starts at just 1517 per year, which I understand is an inside joke for you Lutherans. And, speaking of online hangouts, I have a note here that says the next online hangout will be on Friday, June 23rd, at 8.30 p.m. Central Time. So, mark your calendars, and come join Lloyd and the cast, and other members of the Gun Club. Alright, I believe that is all I have to mention before we begin. Lloyd told me to keep it brief. Time to get the show started. Sergeants Bill, Mia, and Pastor Bennett are up next. Rumors of Lloyd's death have been greatly exaggerated, so he will be with you next week for episode 364. Until then, I believe Lloyd says, keep shooting, keep praying, we will talk to you next time. Time now for Mia's Motivations with Mia Einstein. Well, hey, hi, hello. It's Mia Anstein visiting with you again. I'm so happy to be chatting with you. And I am hoping that Lloyd will be feeling better soon because we don't need our head honcho to be under the weather and not feeling well, especially when you need your voice. So hopefully keep him in your prayers. Hopefully he's doing good by now. Today, I wanted to visit with you a little bit. I saw a post on Twitter the other day, and I actually shared it. It was an article about technology and the use of red dots and optics and how they're the standard on firearms now. And I kind of had to hesitate when I saw that because I don't know, are they the standard? I embrace technology and Everything is just kind of moving so quickly with technology, and it seems like every aspect of our lives includes technology, and that it, that includes the firearms. So we've got these red dots on our handguns and on our ARs, but then on hunting rifles, we have these scopes that can 
calculate the the trajectory of the bullet and the they can identify the animal and see if it's legal and actually there's one that can tell us the score of the antlers. While we do have this technology, what I wanted to talk to you about is ethics and also traditions. So when we're hunting in most locations that I have been in most states, the technology of a scope that will actually track an animal and identify if it's a elk or a deer, that technology is not legal as of yet, but things are happening so fast and changing so much that I'm just curious if you guys agree with that philosophy, or do you think we need these kind of devices that can lock onto a target and allow us to just pull the trigger and the bullet's going to hit our mark? I really ponder it because I think some of it just goes a little bit too far. The idea of technology is we want improved safety. We want better accuracy. We want more efficiency. We also want to have, if we're hunting, we want to have a one-shot clean kill. And that's always the goal is to have the best shot so that we don't have anything suffering and so forth. So how does that transfer over to our self-defense gear? When we have our self-defense gear and we've got these lasers and red dots and different things on our AR, if it's a home defense rifle, if we have that and it's something that could track somebody, I'm not sure how that would work in a high stress, quick situation. So this is something that we need to think about. We want to increase that accuracy. So as I said, that technology has revolutionized a lot of accuracy. It makes us more precise and effective. And it also helps if we can combine that gadget with like our fancy triggers and adjust them to exactly how we would like them. Some of this is pretty cool because it makes life easier for us. My main thing is how much do we want to depend on these devices? Do we want to stay old school and basic for some of it? Because what happens if you didn't practice enough and you don't get your laser turned on and you haven't been using your sights? We still have to practice that old school stuff. I actually had at one point on one of my hunts, it's one of my favorite stories and I tell it a lot, but I had my scope, a very nice scope, wasn't electronics, no lasers, nothing like that, just a nice scope. I had been hunting the day before and I was looking at an elk that was pretty far away and I, I passed. I didn't, it was too far for me to take a comfortable shot. The next day I'm out hunting at first thing in the morning, immediately get in the middle of these elk and they're fighting and retting and pushing each other around. And I'm trying to get in a position with Hank, my husband, we're trying to get in a position where I can look and see what they are. Are they bulls that are of legal stature and size that I can shoot one? Before we could even get where we were going, a bull just backdoors us and was ready to kill us. And my husband, he dove for the oak brush. He didn't have a gun. I had a gun. And I turn and at 25 feet, there is this bull with just snot coming out of his nose and he's huffing and puffing and he's trying to smell me, figure out what I am. And I've got my rifle and I raise it up because this bull is about to just mow me down. And I was too close. I couldn't even see through the scope. I had it zoomed up before, regardless of whether I had it zoomed up. I could not see through the scope. It was too close. So what I did is I looked down the side of the barrel because the way the scope was, I couldn't see the sights because the ocular end of that optic was too low for me to see a sight. So I was able to shoot down the side of the barrel. I did tag that bull. But that's something that we have to sometimes go back to basics and we have to practice in these situations what happens if that laser doesn't work. And I'm not referring to competition because competition is entirely different. Some of you probably have backup guns. You probably have contingency plans. You probably have extra batteries and that kind of thing. 
But here in my area, there have been break-ins in the neighborhood in the middle of the night. Usually around midnight is what we're told. What do I do if I am half asleep and groggy and I hear something and I don't get the buttons pushed? I do have a crimson trace grip that when I grip that, when I squeeze the grip, the laser turns on. I have to practice with that laser because also where I keep my trigger finger on the side of the frame, my trigger finger blocks that laser. So there's these things in these situations that we've got to practice with them. And we also have to remember the basics. So that's something that I just encourage you to try to do is if you go to the range Practice without all that technology. Make sure that you're still the number one thing behind that firearm and that you're not relying on all of this technology to get the job done. On that note, I hope you are getting out to practice. I hope you're enjoying some outdoor time and that you have maybe tried some new shooting schools or training or technology. And I look forward to visiting with you all and seeing your somewhat humorous posts over in the Arm Lutheran Radio Facebook page and also seeing some posts at the Reformation Gun Club. Until next time, have a great one. You can read more from Mia, watch her YouTube videos, or check out her podcast, Mac Outdoors with Mia and Leah, at miaanstein.com. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill, and this is my Ballistic Minute. Today I'm going to do a review of... The TSOS 1911 Tank Commander. So it's actually the 1911 A1 Tank Commander. So it's your GI style commander, four and a quarter inch barreled 1911 in nine millimeter. It's got some wooden grips. They don't have a US on them. I guess uh, Springfield's got that market on those. But they're, you know, nice double diamond wooden grips. You know, it's your typical GI old school 1911 but in nine millimeter i got this at about 399 dollars with tax and everything it was a pretty good deal i just wanted to try it out and see what it was like i'm a big fan of nine millimeter 1911s um this size with the full size grip and the slightly shorter slide and barrel seemed interesting and to be perfectly honest of all the 1911s i've ever owned i've never had a gi style beaver tail so i've never actually even shot one so i didn't know a lot of people talk about hammer bite this doesn't have a spur style hammer it's got a little bit of like a ring hammer but it's very similar to a spur style hammer um so it's short enough that you're not going to get any hammer bite but the little stubby beaver tail is kind of interesting Um, The first day I got it, I took it to the range, and I put about 200 rounds through it, and it shot really well. Did it have some failure to ejects? Yes, because like most factory-built 1911s, the extractor needed some tensioning. I actually have a tensioning tool. I brought it home, and I put it on the gauge, and it was way off. It was barely, barely holding the cases, barely doing its job. So I adjusted a little bit, took a couple little tweaks. And then I got it fitting exactly right according to the adjustment. And it shoots really good. I put an ambi safety on it because, well, I'm a lefty and I kind of need it. Um, It was oversprung, which is typical for a factory 1911. The recoil spring was really stiff. The main spring was a little heavy. Um, It probably had a, I think it was about a six and a half pound trigger, maybe five and a half to six, somewhere in there. Um, I put one pound less recoil spring and a pound less mainspring in it and now it's a real nice four to four and a half it it feels pretty good it's not you know like a wilson combat or anything but for the money doing barely any work to this and putting barely any money into it it's a pretty nice gun i will say this the sights if you're a sight snob they're better than most gi 1911 sights but the front sight even though it has serrations on it and it's ramped, it's really hard to see 
Uh, you could see it pretty well in bright daylight, like the two couple times that I've shot it, but any reduced light, and it's it's pretty difficult to find it. Um, I would suggest, and I haven't done this yet, but I probably will, I've got some front sight paint. I'll put a little dab of red or orange or something bright on there, so it is a lot easier to pick up. Uh, I tried putting some of the magwells that I had onto this, you know, like a Smith & Alexander and a couple STIs that I had on some other guns that I'd taken off and put competition magwells on, and they just didn't work. They didn't work with the mainspring. They didn't fit in there quite right, so... The Magwell has a nice bevel on it, surprisingly, for as cheap as this gun is. Um, this gun is made in Turkey, and I've been pretty impressed with it. So if you're looking for a GI style 1911 in 9mm that only needs the extractor tension to make it pretty reliable, go check out the TSOS 1911 Tank Commander in 9mm. I'm Sergeant Bill. This has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Force and a masterclass competitive shooter. You can check out his YouTube videos at armedlutheran.us slash Sergeant Bill. It's time for Pastoral Pontifications with Pastor John Bennett. Hey folks, this is the Pistol Packing Padre Pastor John Bennett, and today I'm talking about discipline. About a month ago or so, I was at a pastor's conference, and unfortunately I was only able to be there for about half a day. I had a death in the congregation that I had to get back for that. So I spent seven hours on the road that day for basically four hours at this conference. And uh, in hindsight, it was very much worth it. The keynote speaker was Dr. Beverly Yonke, and for those of you who aren't Missouri Synod pastors who have never heard the name before, she's a clinical psychologist with an organization called Doxology, and this organization, they are really geared towards helping pastors be as effective as they possibly can in their ministry, and they do this by offering retreats that are really designed to strengthen pastors uh, psychologically, spiritually, and so forth, so that they can more effectively shepherd the flock under their care. And the reason why it was so much worth it just for the few hours that I was there, I ended up spending more time on the road than at the conference, it was worth it because she said something that has stuck with me. She said, choose what to think and what to do. Now this is an incredibly simple thing. It really makes perfect sense. But as simple as it sounds, in practice, it's a lot more difficult. Now, I've been using this saying and applying it to certain aspects of my life. Up until recently, it was mostly just trying to Keep that in mind when my mind would wander and I'd find myself dwelling on conflicts that happened in the past because those kinds of things, when you dwell on them, they have a nasty way of distracting you from the things that you should be focusing on. I've been applying this also to my work so that I can be more studious and more deliberate in how I structure my day. But in addition to all of that, and this was just about a week ago, I have been applying this to other aspects of life as well. Now, as I've mentioned on the podcast before, mostly in, in discussions with Lloyd, that I've been struggling with a heart condition that I was diagnosed with late last year. And like a lot of folks, and I'm sure this applies to a lot of you listening, I've struggled with my weight. I, you know, I always, I try to lose weight and I lose a few pounds, but those few pounds always seem to have a way of finding me again. And then about a week ago, as I was reflecting on that saying, choose what to think and what to do, I had an epiphany. Now, some of you, this you know, isn't going to seem like some earth-shattering realization that you've probably realized this some time ago and you've been embracing it ever since. But for me, this way of thinking is a little bit new. I came to the realization 
when thinking about my personal health, specifically weight loss, that I'm choosing to be this tub of lard. I'm choosing this every time I choose to eat more than I should, or I choose not to exercise, or I choose to eat something that's terribly unhealthy for me. Now, it's okay to eat unhealthy once in a while, but when every meal is something that, you know, is a cardiologist's nightmare, you should probably lay off of the the fast foods and the foods with trans fats, which, you know, just the word trans makes that sound terribly unhealthy to begin with. So I've been choosing to be this way. How do I choose differently? It requires being disciplined. I have to make the conscious decision that I'm going to be more disciplined with what I'm putting into my body. I've been making the conscious decision to exercise even when I don't feel like it because exercise has just never been anything that I've been terribly thrilled about in the past. And strangely enough, I find myself actually enjoying it. And you can apply this to just about every aspect of your life, this philosophy of choosing what to think and what to do. You know, let's say you want to shave a tenth or two off of your split times, but you just don't feel like putting in that dry fire practice time. If you do that, you're actively choosing not to practice, and therefore you are choosing not to improve. If you are choosing what to think and what to do, and this applies to everything, whether we realize it or not, we are making a choice, and we're making hundreds, if not thousands of choices every day. So choose the effort that equates with the outcome that you're looking for. You're due for promotion at work. You had a supervisor who just retired, but you're satisfied with just putting in the bare minimum. And if that's what you're doing, you are in essence turning down a promotion or a potential of a promotion because you are making the choice not to put in the kind of effort that an employer is looking for in a supervisor. You can apply this to even your spiritual life. You make excuses not to get to church on Sunday morning or if there's other services at your church throughout the week. You're constantly looking for things to keep yourself occupied and in essence you are, without realizing it, intentionally distracting yourself from the spiritual nourishment of your faith, and so you are actively choosing not to pursue the best possible spiritual health that you can have. You can apply this to your personal relationships. You have a conflict with your spouse or a friend or a loved one, and you choose to hold on to your pride, insist that there's nothing that you've done to be, you know, for you to be at fault and you can't embrace a little bit of humility and try and reconcile with them. And by doing this, you're choosing not to protect this relationship that you have with someone you care about. Whatever situation that you find in life, whether it's a financial situation or it's your position at work or it's your physical or spiritual health, choose what to think and what to do. Be disciplined in the choices that you make. And if you do this, in the end, you'll be a lot better off for it. Well, that about wraps it up for this time. I'm now going to hit the treadmill and we'll talk to you again soon. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Check out the Facebook page, The Armed Lutheran, or join our Facebook group, Fans of Armed Lutheran Radio. 
If you like what you hear, please leave us a comment on our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback or a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network.